Hello and thank you for tuning in. My name is Magnus von Wangenheim and in this video I would like to show you what the disclosures of Wikileaks reveal about the lead up to the Ukraine war. Thanks to Wikileaks we have access to tens of thousands of diplomatic cables written by American ambassadors from around the world between 1966 and February 2010. These classified documents contain conversations with political decision makers as well as analysis and assessments of the situation in the respective countries. They were leaked to Wikileaks by a whistleblower and published by Wikileaks in cooperation with major newspapers starting in 2010. So let's use this unique opportunity to see how diplomats and politicians from Russia, the United States, Germany and other countries have assessed the situation in Ukraine. These diplomatic cables give us unique insights into the analysis and intentions of politicians and provide answers to the questions of whether Russian, American and German politicians foresaw the conflict in Ukraine and whether Ukraine's accession to NATO was really being pursued by the West. Furthermore, they show us the view of Russian politicians as well as the position of the German government under Merkel regarding Ukraine. The analysis of these diplomatic cables does not, of course, provide us with an all-encompassing view of all the factors that contributed to the war in Ukraine, since we only have the cables written up to the beginning of 2010. However, they do show us the factors that led to tensions at the time between the United States and Ukraine on the one hand, and Russia on the other. A discussion of the extent to which these factors and points of contention that led to tensions back then are partly responsible for today's tensions could be very revealing. I want to point out that under each diplomatic cable presented in this video you will find the title of the original document. If you would like to read through the original document yourself Simply enter that title into an internet search engine, which should bring up the corresponding Wikileaks page. Alternatively, there is a PDF document link below this video, where you can find the links to all the documents mentioned here. Let's start with the question, to what extent politicians were aware of the potential for conflict in Ukraine. For this, let's take a look at the notes of the US ambassador in Moscow in February 2008. His notes are titled, quote, Nyet means Nyet, Russia's red lines on NATO expansion, end quote. The US ambassador writes, quote, Ukraine and Georgia's NATO aspirations not only touch a raw nerve in Russia, they engender serious concerns about the consequences for stability in the region. Not only does Russia perceive encirclement and efforts to undermine Russia's influence in the region, but it also fears unpredictable and uncontrolled consequences which would seriously affect Russian security interests. Experts tell us that Russia is particularly worried about the strong divisions in Ukraine over NATO membership, with much of the ethnic Russian community against membership, could lead to a major split involving violence or at worst civil war. In that eventuality, Russia would have to decide whether to intervene, a decision Russia does not want to have to face. So much for the assessment of the American ambassador in Moscow. In the same cable, the view of Dmitry Trinin, deputy director of the Moscow Carnegie Center, is also reflected. Quote, Trinin expressed concern that Ukraine was, in the long term, the most potentially destabilizing factor in US-Russian relations, given the level of emotion and neuralgia triggered by its quest for NATO membership. Trenin expressed concern that elements within the Russian establishment would be encouraged to meddle, stimulating US overt encouragement of opposing political forces and leaving the US and Russia in a classic confrontational posture." End quote. In a June 2008 cable, the aforementioned Mr. Trenin of the Moscow Carnegie Center also expressed, quote, considerable concern over the lack of consensus on the issue of NATO membership in Ukraine, where Western Ukrainians saw Russia as a historic aggressor, while a large number of Ukrainians saw Russia more benignly. Quote, a separate country, but not a foreign country, end quote, in Trenin's words. Should Ukraine pursue NATO membership, Trenin feared that 
this divide would widen and lead to violence. End quote. Interestingly, the records of the American ambassadors contain similar warnings from Germany and France. I will show you the concerns of German politicians in detail in a moment. First, here is a statement from the French president's foreign policy advisor who warned in September 2005 that, quote, the question of Ukrainian accession to NATO remained extremely sensitive for Moscow and concluded that if there remained one potential cause for war in Europe, it was Ukraine. He added that some in the Russian administration felt we were doing too much in their core zone of interest, end quote. So one thing is very clear from the diplomatic cables. The United States, other NATO countries and Russia were aware of the great potential for conflict that NATO's expansion into Ukraine holds. But was Ukraine's accession to NATO really being pursued by the West? For this, we again take a look at the records of the US ambassadors. That the United States were seeking NATO expansion into Ukraine is made most clear in a September 2009 cable from the US ambassador in Kiev, which under the heading, quote, the way forward, end quote, states that analysts consider the following point essential, quote, pursue Western integration and NATO enlargement deliberately, but quietly. There is no prospect of rapid movement on this front, and we can agree to firmly disagree with the government of Russia while continuing our efforts to promote Ukraine's integration with the West. End quote. Let us now see how this attempt to integrate Ukraine into NATO was perceived in Russia. In a February 2008 cable, the US ambassador notes, quote, Foreign Minister Lavrov and other senior officials have reiterated strong opposition, stressing that Russia would view further eastward expansion as a potential military threat. NATO enlargement, particularly to Ukraine, remains an emotional and neuralgic issue for Russia, but strategic policy considerations also underlie strong opposition to NATO membership for Ukraine and Georgia. In Ukraine, these include fears that the issue could potentially split the country in two, leading to violence or even, some claim, civil war, end quote. Lavrov stressed that, quote, while Russia might believe statements from the West that NATO was not directed against Russia, when one looked at recent, mili recent military activities in NATO countries, they had to be evaluated not by stated intentions, but by potential. End quote. Let's look at another statement from the Russian side, this time from Grigory Karasin, the Russian deputy foreign minister, who asserted in March 2008, quote, that the United States and NATO had to choose what kind of Russia it wanted to deal with, a Russia that is stable and ready to calmly discuss issues with, with the United States, Europe and China, or one that is deeply concerned and filled with nervousness. He then framed the issue another way by asking whether the goal of the United States and NATO was to push all the former Soviet countries, including Belarus, into NATO in an effort to isolate Russia, or to make the rational and realistic choice of allowing these countries to remain free and engage both with the West and Russia. Karazin argued that the international community had reached a crossroad and the future in many ways depends on the strategic choice that the United States make. End quote. In March 2008, the US ambassador to Moscow noted, quote, Defense and security experts note that NATO enlargement is one of the few security areas where there is almost complete consensus among Russian policymakers, experts, and the informed population. They are strongly against NATO's enlargement eastward, particularly to Ukraine and Georgia. Alexander Belkin, Deputy Executive Director of the Council on Foreign and Defense Policy, said Ukraine was the line of last resort. If Ukraine becomes a member of NATO, Russia's encirclement will be complete. He said there was almost universal agreement among Russia's political elite that NATO's attempt to bring in Ukraine was an unfriendly act. End quote. There are many more records of how NATO's expansion into Ukraine 
was perceived as a threat by policymakers in Russia. I would like to show you one more of them. The US ambassador in Moscow wrote in January 2009, quote, a panel of senior Russian security analysts told representatives that many Russians lacked trust in the United States, which was perceived to be indifferent or even hostile to Russian interests. The analysts painted a gloomy picture of the bilateral relations that they blamed largely upon the US's failure to treat Russia as a partner." End quote. One of the Russian security experts raised the objection that, quote, the US is pushing NATO enlargement without taking Russian security concerns into account, and complained that nothing substantial was done in the way of NATO-Russia cooperation. He advised that in a partnership, one partner should think about how the other perceived things. End quote. Another Russian security expert commented, quote, The crux of Russia's poor opinion of the United States was Washington's penchant to lecture Moscow on governance. We are building a democracy in our way and don't want foreign interference, he complained. The fact that the United States failed to live up to its own supposed high standards on human rights in Iraq, Afghanistan and Guantanamo made this especially galling for Russians. He maintained that the war in Iraq played a large part in souring Putin on wanting to be a member of the club of forward-leaning countries by demonstrating that if a country had enough power, it could do what it wanted and ignore international opinion. End quote. The analysts agreed that it appeared Ukraine and Georgia were being pushed by the United States toward NATO membership. They offered as evidence the US plan to get Ukraine and Georgia into the alliance without MAP after NATO members rejected extending it at the Bucharest summit. End quote. MAP stands for Membership Action Plan and is the precursor to full NATO membership. Another security expert said, quote, The United States pushing policies such as NATO membership for Ukraine only helped the America haters come to power in Russia. End quote. The position of Russian decision makers and security experts is clear. They see the attempt to integrate Ukraine into the West and NATO as a provocation against Russia and as destabilizing for Ukraine. Let us now see what position the German government under Angela Merkel has taken regarding Ukraine. For this purpose, let us first look at the recording of the American ambassador in Berlin, written in June 2008, in which the American diplomat David Merkel speaks with the German diplomats Rolf Nickel and Norman Walter about a NATO membership of Ukraine or its preliminary stage, a membership action plan, in short MAP. Quote, Both Nickel and Walter raised concerns that if MAP were pushed forward too quickly in Ukraine, where public opinion is bitterly divided on the issue of NATO membership, it could prove destabilizing and split the country. End quote. The German diplomat Rolf Nickel emphasized that, quote, the geostrategic context of a Georgian accession to NATO was quite different from that of Ukraine. While Georgia was just a bug on the skin of the bear, Ukraine was inseparably identified with Russia, going back to Vladimir of Kiev in 988. End quote. Further, he said, quote, that Germany thought it was wrong to see MAP as a tool to facilitate democratic and military reforms in countries like Ukraine and Georgia, when it was really the last step to NATO membership. End quote. The German diplomat Rolf Nickel then gives three reasons why Ukraine's NATO membership is too risky. Quote, First, overall low public support for NATO membership. Second, a deep divide between the eastern and western parts of the country on this question. And third, a weak government with a small majority in the Rada, the Ukrainian parliament. 
Walter agreed and thought that MAP and the issue of NATO membership could break up the country if pushed forward too quickly. End quote. In the concluding commentary, the US ambassador writes, quote, We have our work cut out for us in convincing them to agree to MAP. End quote. In its persuasion efforts, the United States received support from other NATO members. This can be seen, among other things, in a cable from June 2008. Quote, On his subsequent trip to Europe, Harper, the Canadian Prime Minister at that time, pressed his Italian, German, French and British counterparts for the quick extension of MAP to Ukraine and Georgia. Sinclair, a Canadian senior official, said, Canada's bottom line is that MAP is imperative for Ukraine, but Georgia too, end quote. That at the time the German Chancellor and Foreign Office defended their position on NATO expansion into Ukraine, even in the face of strong pressure from abroad, is evident from a June 2008 cable written by the US ambassador in Berlin. Quote, We will have to engage regularly with the German government at very senior levels over the next several months to have any hope of getting the Germans on board with extending MAP to Georgia and Ukraine at the NATO foreign ministers meeting in December. The German Nine at Bucharest came from the Chancellor herself and she has shown little indication of flexibility on this point since then. While it is tempting to attribute Germany's position on MAP to a feckless concern for Russian sensitivities, Merkel and her senior advisors seem to have some genuine reservations about the Georgian and Ukrainian candidacies, which we should take seriously and attempt to address. End quote. Further, it says, quote, Merkel has demonstrated that she is ready to withstand considerable pressure. Since the summit, she has shown little indication of backing down from her view that Georgia, because of a democratic deficit and separatist conflicts, and Ukraine, because of the uncertain public support for NATO membership, are simply not ready to join MAP and may not be for some time to come. It is also important to note that the Chancellor enjoys almost unanimous political support within Germany for this approach. The Chancellery and Foreign Office are concerned that granting MAP too soon, before there is a consensus in favor, could prove destabilizing and split the country between the pro-Russian East and the relatively more pro-NATO West. End quote. The diplomatic cables reveal how the issue of Ukraine's alignment already led to tensions between the United States and Russia years ago. Despite numerous warnings and fears that the continuation of the policy at that time could lead to instability and civil war in Ukraine and to a confrontation between the United States and Russia, there is unfortunately no evidence in any of the cables that efforts were made to abandon this confrontational course. The original documents shown in this video are only available to us thanks to Julian Assange and Wikileaks. Because of the publication of these documents, Julian Assange has been in pre-trial detention for almost four years now and is being held under the harshest prison conditions, at times even in solitary confinement, in a high-security prison in London. He is being held there because the United States are demanding his extradition and a prison sentence of 175 years for these publications. The US indictment is based on the US Espionage Act and is sharply criticized because it criminalizes Julian Assange's journalistic activities and because this is the first time in history that US espionage law has been applied extraterritorially, that is, outside the United States. This sets a dangerous precedent that can be applied in court against other journalists around the world, which will deter many from publishing original documents from US agencies intelligence services and the military, even if those documents contain evidence of moral wrongdoing. Finally, a few closing words from Julian Assange himself. 
I thank you in advance for your attention and would be happy if you subscribe to us on Rumble, Telegram or YouTube and support our work with a donation. All men by nature desire to know. Aristotle, when he wrote this, was saying that the thing that makes human beings different from other creatures, the thing that defines us, is the pursuit and acquisition of knowledge. This is not just to say that we, human beings, are curious creatures. It is to say that our ability to think about and to act on the world around us is bound up with our ability to know it. To be alive as a human being is to know in the same way as it is to have a heart that beats. We all understand this in mundane ways. We understand, for instance, that part of being a fully independent adult, making choices about life, is learning about the world around us and informing our choices with that learning. In the book of Proverbs, it says, By wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. But there is something more to all of this. The very next saying in Proverbs is, The wise are mightier than the strong. This is the earliest occurrence known to me of the now well-known idea. Knowledge is power. To keep a person ignorant is to place them in a cage. So it follows that the powerful, if they want to keep their power, will try to know as much about us as they can, and they will try to make sure that we know as little about them as is possible. I see this insight everywhere, both in religious writings, which promised emancipation from political repression, and in the revolutionary works promising liberation from the repressive dogmas of the church and the state. The powerful throughout history have understood this. The invention of the printing press was opposed by the old powers of Europe because it spelled the end of their control of knowledge and therefore the end of their tenure as power brokers. The Protestant Reformation was not just a religious movement but a political struggle. The fight to liberate hoarded knowledge through translation and dissemination. Through the confessional system, the Catholic Church spied upon the lives of its congregants. While Latin Mass excluded most people who could not speak Latin from an understanding of the very system of thought that bound them. Knowledge has always flowed upwards to bishops and kings, not down to serfs and slaves. The principle remains the same in the present era. Documents disclosed by NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden show that governments dare to aspire through their intelligence agencies to a godlike knowledge about each and every one of us. But at the same time, they hide their actions behind official secrecy. As our governments and corporations know more and more about us, we know less and less about them. The policy, as always, is to channel the decisive information upwards, never downwards. Today, remember that it is good to seek to empower the powerless through knowledge, and to drag the machinations of the powerful into the daylight. We must be unapologetic about that most basic of humanities, the desire to know. The powerful would do well to remember the words of one of history's great activists, as recorded in the book of Matthew. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear, in the inner rooms, will be proclaimed at last from rooftop to rooftop.